I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Ashley Kerr. Ashley, I think, uh, probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. She's one of the hosts of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Podcast. Um, Ashley, I'm very, very excited to have you on today. Thank you for thank you for taking the time out. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I think it'll be great. Um, if you would, would you start by just kind of telling people your background, your story, what got you into real estate, and then we can kind of dive in from there? Yeah, sure. So I actually went to college to be an accountant, and I wanted to become a CPA. So I started interning at a CPA firm while I was in college. They offered me a full-time position right after college. I started working full-time in September, and by February, I already quit and put my two weeks notice in. I hated it. I dreaded the drive to work. I dreaded sitting in that office. I dreaded the smell of the office. It got so horrible that I just couldn't take it anymore. And I'm like, that's it. I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. I'm not cut out to sit at an office and do the same thing over and over again and just for different companies. And I remember the day that I put my two weeks notice in, I was like, shaking. Like, I don't know how I didn't start like crying, putting this out. I was so scared to tell them that I was leaving in the middle of tax season. (laughs) And I remember the managing partner. So one of the owners of the company said to me, she's like, you know, I've worked here for how long? And you know, I'm a managing partner and I still don't make what I want to make. Like, that's just the way it is. Cause that was part of it too. The pay was just not what I expected. I'm like, why am I killing myself for this little pay? So just that always stuck with me and still sticks with me is that like, okay, this person who has gotten done the CPA exam has gone through, um, you know, a ton of schooling and is now a managing partner, like has succeeded and owns part of this great accounting firm, isn't even making the money that she wants and, you know, working her tail off and taking two weeks vacation out of the year. And I just didn't want that life. And I think she really reaffirmed my decision to leave. And like, I'm thankful <laughs> for her for that because I don't ever look back and, and feel bad that I left. So that was definitely a big turning point for me. And I was just going to be a stay-at-home mom. And then I was approached by my best friend growing up, her dad saying, you know, I just need some help with some things. You're an accountant. You must know how to do business stuff. So he's like, I have this 40 unit apartment complex. I need someone to manage it here you go. And so I could do the bookkeeping for it, but I had no idea of what a lease looked like, uh, any of the landlord laws, uh, fair housing laws, nothing. So I basically built a property management company from scratch and I learned and educated myself as much as possible. And then I actually approached his son um, that I also grew up with and said, Hey, look what your dad is doing. He's got all these investment properties we should do this too. So he was my, my first partner on our first duplex. That's kind of the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> what started. But, I mean, that's a, that's a really cool start. And I, I guess one thing that comes to mind, what did you think it was going to be like to be a CPA? Because I, I, as yeah. someone who's not <laughs> being in an office that I guess that's kind of what I imagined. And so what, what did you, how did you picture that going? I I think I must have had this idea in my head, maybe from movies or something. But I remember like when I first started to get like clients and um, them giving me workload and I would like sometimes take it home and do some work at night. And I like felt so cool. Here I am a businesswoman with my files going home with extra work, (laughs) which I did not realize at first is like, that's not the life that, you know, I actually (laughs) wanted (laughs) is to be, you know, taking extra work home to get caught up. And I thought it would be a lot higher pay. I think I, when I was interning, I was maybe getting 1250 an hour. And then it bumped up to $15 an hour when I was a full-time staff accountant. 
So this was in 2012. So it still was not, a, you know, a high, like high pay rate wage at all for that time. And they just said, well, you know, we'll reevaluate in a couple of years. And there's, if there's room for increase. And so that was like a big part of it, but I didn't think that I would get so bored just sitting at a desk every day. I thought that it would be more, um, that I would be fine just doing the work, getting into the numbers because I love that. And I, but I think a part of it was, was it was other people's numbers. It wasn't my numbers on my rental property and to see how it's cash flowing. So there was a lot of things I realized about myself. Also that I, when I started working as a property manager, I loved the hustle and bustle of running around and like going to the different properties and having a different to-do list every single day. And, you know, each day was never the same. So it took me a while to like realize these things about me and what I liked and what I didn't like. But looking back now, I can see like, wow, yeah, that really kind of shaped me into, you know, who I am today and who I like to be and what I like to do. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it sounds like, (laughs) sounds like from, from the moment you left that job, you realized how entrepreneurial you were and sort of now it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to build, I'll just build a business business instead of this property management business. And so it is, you know, sometimes we don't know those things about ourselves, that kind of Mm -hmm. self-awareness is super important. And I think it's funny that you mentioned about what your, your, the partner said to you, because I think that's kind of a good thing that, that a lot of people don't think about. They want to get into their own business and they don't, necessarily realize how to not just be maybe the highest paid employee in their own business rather than right. being the business owner and letting it run itself and that and, and so I, I think there's like Robert Kiyosaki talks a lot about that's you know being being the the self-employed versus being an, an investor and entrepreneur the, the the big difference is there so you basically uh, own a job I think is right, something right. along the lines he says yeah yeah and and you know you're you're boss at the time was obviously wasn't happy in that position and maybe just didn't know how to <laughs> make that transition into, you know, sort of just letting everybody else do the work and, and being mm-hmm. just the business owner. So uh, I think everybody, we all have those like moments where someone else, and I don't know if at the time it struck you, but like it becomes, you look back and it's like, here's this thing that happened that maybe seemed like a little thing, but in reality, it's a little bit of a, a you know switch on that on your mindset as, as you see what someone else has done, and you're like, why didn't that work out the way that you think it should? And right. you know, try to try to learn from there. So uh, that's that, that's a cool um, you know, kind of anecdote there. But so you you bought this duplex, and then kind of what have from, happened from there? I think with with your accounting background, that, that obviously means you're good at running the numbers and everything like that. And then you became a property manager. So you sort of figured a lot of this out. How did how did it work? How did that first deal go? Uh, yeah, so the first deal was actually the first property we looked at. And I had started kind of planting the seed in my partner, like, hey, we should really do this. And like, he really didn't even know the extent of what his dad was doing. And another kind of impactful moment in my life was when I started working for him, probably it had been four months, he was purchasing an auto dealership. And he took me to the closing table with him. And he had me write out the checks and he paid cash for this. So it was a very huge amount. But learning how he was actually able to pay cash, it wasn't that he had cash just sitting in his personal bank account. Mm -hmm. He went to his investment properties refinance them, hold the cash out and use that to purchase a business. So just learning like how that worked was just like, wow, okay, I want rental properties because I want to be able to pull money out and go buy other things with it and learning how that process actually worked. So that's when I uh, approached his son. And so we purchased our first rental property together. It was just a small little duplex. It was in the same town we had gone to high school in, the same town the apartment complex was in. So I felt very confident in uh, the numbers on the deal and that I could manage it. And then he uh, actually supplied the capital to purchase that property. He took his savings and we used that to purchase it in cash. Um, we renovated the upstairs. He actually had a roommate at the time and his roommate did the renovation work for us for a couple of months 
free without having to pay rent. So that was like another benefit of taking on my partner. He gave up a couple of months of rent in his own house to um, have our renovations done for free. And then we just uh, paid for materials. And then we rented out both units and he ended up going and getting a, a home equity loan on his house. And we took that money and bought a second duplex right down the street. And then we ended up going to a bank and it had been a bank that I had done a bunch of uh, mortgages with for his father. So I had a good relationship with this bank already because I hadn't done a loan with them, but I had for this investor. And anytime they asked me for anything, I always responded quickly. They knew that I would get it to them and that, um, you know, I wasn't going to be a, a problem client <laughs> that it would, the, the process would go smoothly. So I built this great relationship and they actually gave us a portfolio loan. So they kept it in house and it covered the two properties that we had purchased. Then we took that money and we purchased our third duplex. And then from there, it kind of started to spiral. I ended up going and buying a couple on my own. And then I took on a second partner and bought some. I bought one with my sister, bought one with my brother. And then uh, recently I took on another partner where we're purchasing the um, land, like, uh, like at least like three or more acres on it. And then cabins and we're remodeling those into uh, short-term rentals. Oh, cool. Cool. That's a, I mean, cause you're in, you're in Buffalo, New Outside York. Of Buffalo. Yeah. New okay. York. Yeah. I, thought, I thought so. Yeah. Um, different. It's not the tradition, one of the traditional markets, I think that people think about, yeah. you know, in terms of investing, but as you said, like you're local to it, you have bank relationships, you know, you, you, you went to high school, like, you know, everybody in, and mm-hmm. kind of the market. I think that's, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I got to, you got to go to the Southeast or whatever it is, Texas to invest. But realistically, being where you are and and knowing that so well, I think that's a, a competitive advantage in terms of, you know, what you're doing. Um, and now, you know, adding in short term rentals and diversifying the portfolio. I mean, just, it seems like, seems like a really great strategy. Um, you have a, a liquor store too, right? Is that another? Yeah thing. Yeah. So that was a, a four unit building I purchased and the investor that I worked for, he owned a liquor store. And so I'd always seen how it was a cash cow for him. And I, he was like, well, if you decide you want to open one, let me know. And you can see the financials go through everything. And I did. And I actually paid his manager to kind of help us start it up. And we applied for our liquor license in November, 2019. So right before COVID. And then we ended up because COVID slowing everything down. We didn't get our liquor license until about September, 2020. And then we opened in November, 2021, but we had uh, remodeled the whole storefront and um, turned it into a liquor store. And I assume that's going well for you. Yeah. Yeah. Out? We have a, a manager who basically takes care of everything. It's very hands off. Um, there's very little we have to do for it. And that's how we wanted it um, to be. And that's how it is for the investor too. So we took a lot of things that, you know, his manager was doing and implemented them into our business too. It's one of those things where if you have a a resource or you have somebody that's doing what you want to do, a lot of times they're not, they're not afraid to share with you what those secrets are because they're not even secrets most of the time. And for example, our liquor store is far enough away where it's not even competition for him. Like I could see him being hesitant if we were opening up right around the corner, but, um, there's no need to recreate the wheel if you have friends, family, or, you know, somebody in your network that is doing what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, that sort of organic mentorship, I think Mm -hmm. is, you know, a lot of people pay a lot of money for (laughs) mentorship, but having someone that, you know, already that's doing it is, I think, like a phenomenal resource that maybe gets overlooked in a lot of cases, you know, just you, you, you asked the question, or maybe he asked you, you said he he asked you to come in and manage that apartment complex. So, it, you know, just sort of worked out fortuitously. And now, now you're in there and you're helping him, he's helping you and you can grow mm-hmm. your business. So I think it's, it's something that I don't, you know, may, maybe a lot of times we don't even realize that that I don't know if you knew before he asked you that, you know, kind of what he was doing, if you had a, a sort of knowledge as to him being an investor. I, I think sometimes I, we just don't know. Yeah. I grew, I grew up with his daughter. So he lived right next door and went on family vacations with them. So he's in the auto dealer 
business. And that was like his main business. I knew he owned a couple properties, but I didn't know to the extent. And then over the years, I've helped him sell and acquire more investment properties and just seeing what he, and he's always done a really good job of involving me in everything. I have so much experience from him and even better, I got paid for all of this experience too. And, and now we kind of like joke back and forth, like, oh, now, you know, instead of me asking him questions, what we need to do, it's him asking me questions of what we need to do. That's a thing. (laughs) Well, the student becomes the teacher. (laughs) So somehow happens over time. Um, that no, that's that's really cool. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got into being the Bigger Pockets rookie real estate host. How how did that sort of come about? Yeah, so I had set kind of a goal for myself that I wanted to be on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I wanted to be a guest, and I was just like such a Bigger Pockets fan. I when I started investing, it was in 2014 and I didn't find out about bigger pockets until 2017. And when I did my, I tripled my portfolio within a year and a half after finding bigger pockets, just digging into the forums, learning about creative financing, all these different things. So it's such a huge impact on me. And so I started an Instagram account. I think I'd been off social media at that time for maybe three years. And so I started a Instagram account just specific to my real estate investing. And I would share a lot of Brandon Turner stuff. And one day I actually got a Instagram message from the producer for bigger pockets saying, Hey, we've been seeing you all over Instagram. We would love to talk to you about being a guest on the show. So I was just like ecstatic, like through the roof. And so I, um, I did the interview with them. And then probably about uh, a month after my podcast episode aired, they had said they were going to start a new podcast and they were looking for ideas as to what the new topic should be. So I submitted something just saying, you know, I think it should be about like growing wealth for your family, how to, you know, have wealth available for your kids when they're grown, something like that. And so the producer called me. He's like, you know, it's maybe that's like one show, not a not a whole a series <laughs> topic. And he's like, but we are very interested in having you as a host. So they paired me up with my first co-host, Felipe Mejia. And so we did like a whole interview process for a couple of months where we did practice interviews. We had to send them in videos. And I remember it was December 16th. It was my mom's birthday. And I missed the phone call because we were singing her happy birthday. And um, so I called him back and he said that, you know, we were selected as the the host of the new show and it was going to be about uh, being rookie. We were going to interview rookie investors. So they didn't really had n- nothing else um, planned, not even a name or anything, just saying it's going to be tailored to new investors. So from December to March, we kind of worked on building out what the the podcast would actually be. And then we launched in March of 2020. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, must have made an impression with your your bigger pockets interview that they're, <laughs> they're like, yeah, come, come be a host so of nervous. another show. I was so nervous for that, and it's so funny just like looking back, like I had to like prepare myself for days. I had all these notes all over around <laughs> my computer that I was like things I wanted to say or to remember, and I remember David Green telling me, you know, you don't have to when we go into like a deep dive, you don't have to get the numbers perfect. Nobody's going to care if you say 100,000 instead of 101,302 right, dollars. And, right. and I just it, it, it like they were so easy to talk to that I didn't even look at any of my notes the whole time, but you now I was so nervous for it. That's awesome. Well, now you do that for other people. You, you, yeah. <laughs> you create <laughs> create that yeah. comfort zone for them and yeah. uh, ha- have them on yours. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what's what's next? What are your what are your plans? You know, kind of from a. I know you said you bought land with cabins and you're going mm-hmm. short term rental. What what's your on your horizon? Yeah. So this is with one of my new uh, business partners. It's kind of a a cool story. We met on a boat last summer by my cousin and we kind of saw each other throughout the summer at different events. And he would talk to me about his job. He was in construction and just hated, um, hated it. He had to go up on, you know, 13 story buildings, hang off scaffolding. And in the winter he was laid off. He didn't do anything except snowboard, hang out and, He um, is also a military veteran. 
So he has health insurance. He has, you know, a bunch of different benefits, a 10% discount at low. So of course the wheels start spinning as to like, okay, maybe during the winter while you're off work, you could try and work alongside me and see if this is something you're interested in. So even before he was done with his job in the fall, he started working alongside me and learning about real estate investing. I mean, he started reading books. He started listening to podcasts, anything I would say he would digest. And so he ended up purchasing, getting three uh, cabins under contract together. And so as soon as he was done with his construction job, he started full-time doing the project management um, on the, the cabins we closed on. And then from there, he's, we've kind of set it up so that he doesn't, um, or right now, I guess it was probably three weeks ago, maybe that he doesn't have to go back to his job. So we'll be able to, to pull enough. And, um, so it's super exciting for all that, <laughs> that has yeah. been able to happen for him. So what we really want to do though, is these cabins are kind of just to help him maintain cash flow so that he could quit his job and, He's taken on um, doing some of the asset management for me too. But what we're really going after right now is um, a campground. We want a campground. So we actually submitted um, uh, an offer back in the fall on a property. We didn't get it. Then they called us back, said we got it. And we ended up just getting our deposit back yesterday because it fell through. There was just too many issues. You couldn't get title insurance on it because it had gone to county tax auction and the bank bought it back and just all of these problems on this property. So that was kind of upsetting. We spent a lot of time and money on it, but lots of lessons learned on it. So we've submitted another offer uh, this week and they countered to us last night and it's actually a pretty reasonable counter. So I think that we'll be able to get that under contract hopefully this week or next week. Cool. Well, yeah. Why a campground? What's the, it's not a common, I guess, at least that I've heard like a common business model. What, what drew you to that? So that's why I like it because it's not common. So you look at self-storage or mobile home parks, like they used to be primarily mom and pop owned. So in 2020, it was, um, I think the statistic is from that there was like 88% of campgrounds and RV parks the person that owned it only owned one. So what that shows is that it's mostly mom and pops that own it. It's not capital, large capital groups or investors because they would most likely have more than one campground. So that right there I saw was like a, a huge, um, you know, advantage right there that there's not already a ton of capital groups going after them. Like there are mobile home parks and self-storage. So that was kind of a draw, but even before that, I kind of spent, most of 2021, like, okay, what do I want to do? Um, do I want to get into self storage? I kind of felt lost. I have all of these people in my network that I can tap into that would help me and I can learn from. So self storage, mobile home parks, multifamily syndications. And so I kind of dabbled in each as to what do I like? What don't I like? And it was actually at the bigger pockets conference and um, at a self-storage conference too, I was talking to Brandon Turner and he was kind of drilling into me, putting me on the hot seat. And he said, um, he's like that right there, the campgrounds, like you're passionate about that. Like, that's what you need to go after. Like hearing me talk about each thing. And I was like, you're right. I love it. The different revenue streams, the potential it has. So for example, the campground that we're trying to get under contract now, it has a cabins on it these cabins can actually be um, turned into short-term rentals and actually list on Airbnb. Could it put a key, a key code lock on it where people can just come check themselves in and out? Uh, there's a, a wedding venue pavilion. There's a little uh, convenience store gift shop. The showers and the washer and dryers are all coin operated. There's um, RV sites. There's tent sites. There's um, a single family house that can be rented out. Uh, there's trees that can be logged into timber and there's maple trees that can be tapped for syrup. So I love looking at things and finding what are the different revenue streams that can come off of a property and campgrounds are just have a limited potential with that. So that really intrigues me a lot. That's super cool. I've never, never really heard anyone talk. And I guess it makes sense. The reason you wouldn't have heard people talk about it is exactly what you're saying. You know, nobody, yeah. nobody else is really getting into that space. 
I feel like people are starting to talk about like RV storage and stuff as, mm-hmm. as and but it's a very interesting idea. It's how like how big how big are these campgrounds that you're looking at? I mean, because I, I feel like they could you know you can find a little tiny campground, but also yeah. there's you know humongous ones. What do you what do you do? You have a, a selection criteria when you're looking for them? Yeah. So right now we're kind of looking. We're open to looking at. Uh, other areas but our main focus is within like two hours of the city of Buffalo so it's not too far for people to come from the city to go and camp we prefer the majority of the campground to be seasonal sites so what this is is that people come they park their camper they pay three thousand dollars and they keep it there from spring to fall and it's not having to have someone there to constantly check someone in and out um, a daily rate One thing that we is in our criteria is we don't want to have a ton of staff and a ton of employees. We don't want to have a million things going on um, that we have to oversee employees, worry about people not showing up, um, having a huge payroll overhead. So we really like uh, campgrounds that don't have that. We like to look at properties that are like 50 to 200 acres at least so that most of these have room for expansion available to them. Um, we actually, the last property we had under contract was 777 acres, which just had unlimited potential to it. And I'm, I'm jealous of whoever wound up being able to purchase the property, but, um, yeah, it's just, um, so looking in the, the, mostly the range, we're not really looking at anything that's under 50 acres just because, um, we want to be able to have people enjoy that outdoor space too. So hiking through the woods, things like that. And are there that many campgrounds in within two hours of, of Buffalo? Yeah. Yeah. There is actually quite a few. I mean, definitely not as much as, you know, self storage or mobile home parks, but But, um, yeah, there is actually quite a few. That's good. I mean, just the other stuff, obviously, as you, as you mentioned, has a lot, maybe a higher competition. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't, there doesn't need to be as much of a supply if, if that's not, that's not the case. So I was just kind of curious what, you know, sort of how, how, how much availability there was in that range, but that's, that's great. I mean, it's very cool. I've never heard anyone sort of talk about that, but it makes total sense. The idea is uh, really all those different revenue streams on the same property. It yeah. seems like a, a really good way to, to sort of maximize what, what you can do with it. And I think, and it, I mean, I guess it's been a while since I've been to a campground, but the, the, thinking about it, I do, there's probably a lot of like unrealized potential. It doesn't, it, mm-hmm. most of these mom and pop owners don't go, you know, have their however many hundred acres and they're like, how can I, you know, sort of optimize each, each area for, for whatever its best use is. So that, I mean, yeah. it, coming at it from a investor standpoint, you can see it with a different eye. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. And like, there's so much value add, especially from the mom and pop ones. Like when we went and looked at this property, the, all the cabins, um, there was, it's just like mismatched furniture in there. And the guy was so proud that he would go down to the local flea market in this little tiny town. And he got this couch for a dollar and stuff like that. And I mean, it wasn't in bad shape or anything. It was just like, there was so much potential to do with the aesthetics of the cabin, you know, yeah. make them Instagrammable and right. <laughs> things like that. Right. But, um, yeah. So just even little things like that is changing out the furniture, um, and the marketing. I mean, they really didn't do any marketing. They have a really nice website, but, um, unless you know about them, you really can't find them. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it sounds, sounds like almost unlimited potential at this point, just yeah. because it's not, it's not something that people are trying to really look at from an investor eye. So, so I love it. I think that's a great, yeah. A great and strategy. another thing we look at too, is what land has sold for around in the area. So for this property across the street, there was um, five acre parcels that were divided off and they were sold for 4,000 an acre. So with even if, you know, worst case scenario, we can parcel off this property into different parcels and sell chunks of land and, you know, make most of our money back if, you know, worst case scenario that were to happen. Yeah, no, I mean that, you know, you were talking about that one that had 700 and something acres, Mm -hmm. like you could easily 
sell off some of that land to a developer and still yeah. have your, you know, or develop it yourself, you know, whatever you want to do, yeah. but you still have that, like, it's just sort of infinite options with, with and which where you can, can you find, especially in Buffalo or even New York, where you can find 777 <laughs> acres. That's right. like close to, I mean, that was only 45 minutes, I would say from the city of Buffalo, like, well. Yeah, that's hard and to that, find. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's a. I love it. I think it's a fantastic strategy. That I, it's very cool. I've never. No one's talked about that. I've never yeah. heard anyone <laughs> say anything about that. So that's really cool. We, we, we maybe edit that out so no, that you don't have competition. We don't want people to, to start thinking about that as well. Uh, I would love to. That's the one that already fell out of contract. So that I would love for somebody to reach out to me and say, "Hey, hey, I'm buying this." So I, I would right. love to help you and see so they, what you're doing with it. And right, yeah, yeah so you can maybe you can uh, form a partnership with with whoever did end yeah, up getting yeah. it and, and f- help them uh, optimize. Yeah, that. I'll even tell them what I had it under contract for because <laughs> as of right now, that property will probably only be able to be sold for a cash offer because you can't get title insurance, so a bank's not going to finance it. And if you do, we were going to do a syndication on it, and our investors aren't going to invest in it if you can't get title insurance on it. So um, there's a redemption period and it's up in it. So it's a three-year redemption period on that. So in two more years, you'll be able to get title insurance on it. I see. I see. So, so someone else bought it and is going to just sit on it for two years, you think? Or how does that? I mean, they could, they could do that, but. Yeah. Um, or I guess yeah, I'm not sure. uh, if they bought it for all cash, then they don't have, they can. Right. Do yeah. If they bought it for all cash, then they could wait two years and go and refinance it with when they'd be able to get that title insurance. Yeah. So. Makes sense. Um, well, let's, let's switch gears here and we'll, we'll get to the point where I ask you the, the questions I ask every guest. Um, okay. The first one being based on the name of the show being know your why. So actually what, what is your why? What, what drives you towards this level of success? So it's more of a word, I guess, than a thing. And obviously it's my kids and my family. And, but I feel like that is such a cheat why to say, because why wouldn't that be your why? So I I tell her, drive deeper, dig deeper into something else. Because yes, your kids, your family, they're your why, but find something else too. And so for me, that's uh, being spontaneous. I want to live a spontaneous life. I want to be able to, um, you know, just be like, okay, kids, yep, I can come pick you up from school if you want me to, or, you know, I can change my day around if possible. Like even for example, for you, my son was sick the first time we were going to record this and I was able to clear my schedule that day. I mean, how many people are able to do that without like large repercussions from a boss or from whoever, or, you know, not making money because they're paid hourly or based on how much they work. So Um, that's kind of what I want is I want like a flexible schedule that I can kind of wake up. And if I decide like, you know what, today, I want to learn how to do a syndication deal. I can go ahead and do that. So, uh, that's what, what really drives me. So to be able to have a spontaneous life, you usually have to have some kind of money, um, or very low expenses, but live way below your means and also, um, time. So those are just two things I'm focusing on is giving myself more time by outsourcing things and also uh, creating wealth so that I can still live the lifestyle that I want plus more and um, have that kind of time freedom. Uh, I I think the, the ability, I guess you underestimate what, how powerful that is to have that spontaneity Mm -hmm. and the time freedom until something like, you know, you have your kids and I totally get what you're saying because my kids and my family say that's my why, but, but like, yeah. but there's a reason why that's your why, right? It's yeah. not, it's not just because they're there. It's like, cause you want to spend time with yeah. them. And when they're sick, you know, there, there are people that, that, that can't stay home from work because they're they're when their kids are sick, they don't, they can't, yeah. can't afford it. They, like you said, there's mm-hmm. repercussions, like whatever the case may be. And so yeah, building that infrastructure around yourself so that in those instances, you can, mm-hmm. you can be like, yep, I'm, I'll be, I'll be here for you. Like, I'll be here with you. Yeah. So, uh, it totally understands for it really, um, powerful thing to, to, to realize that, um, second question for you, tell us something about yourself that maybe isn't common knowledge, special skill, hobby. <laughs> I don't know any, anything that you're comfortable okay. sharing. Um, 
So I have realized that, and this was even when I was a guest on the Bigger Pockets podcast, and they ask at the end of that too, like, what are your hobbies? It's like, I don't have any hobbies. <laughs> All I do is real estate investing. Like, there is nothing else. So um, this past year, I picked up uh, snowboarding and wake surf. Well, I had snowboarded when I was younger, but it had been about five years probably since I had even gone. And so I got back into it. I mean, it was like riding a bike for me and I got to go a couple of times. And then, um, I actually went out to Colorado my first time doing like a big mountain out West. And I was like, yes, I'm 17 again. I can ride <laughs> hard. And my business partner is with me and he was like, wow, you're actually, and he was like a great snowboarder, like did competitions and stuff when he was younger. So I was like, wow, he thinks that I'm actually good went right to my head. I'm weaving out of the woods trails and like, you're not 17 again, went flying into the trees and I tore my ACL and my MCL. Oh, no. So I blame him for hyping me up and like, <laughs> yeah, I still got it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So I, uh, just, that happened in December and I just had surgery, um, about four weeks ago. So oh, I gosh. still have my leg brace on and I'm off crutches though. So been in physical therapy three days a week, trying to get that back going. And then, um, I also took up wake surfing. I'm not good at all. I can get up and I can ride there. I can dance on the board. I can't really carve it all, but my goal is to get my leg healed so that at least by end of July, August, I can be back out wake surfing. Sounds perfect. Yeah. Sounds perfect. I'm sorry about the ACL. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, I, I'm originally from, from Boston. So I, I, when I was younger, did some snowboarding. Never, I was yeah. never good. So the, yeah. the, when I say I did snow, I snowboard, it was like maybe once a year and I was terrible, yeah. But, yeah. but I then had the chance to do it in uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, which is like one of the, it's like a big ski, ski snowboard resort. Yeah. It's not the same at all. Right. right. Like it's, it's, so a, it's not yeah. the same at all. Like no. e the East coast skiing, snowboarding. I mean, it's like, thin icy snow and yeah. then you go up to the west the, the mountains in the west and it's just like it's what it's what you see in pictures of mountains right, and like the, yeah, it's like yeah. just this like beautiful but it's also it I mean takes, I wasn't you know, good so I was terrified half hour to get down the hill <laughs> right. instead of two minutes yeah yeah, yeah it was I, I think I I think I did one run and I was like yeah I'm, I'm not nearly <laughs> skilled enough to be doing this here like it was just yeah. it's a totally different world so it, that's kind of funny so I'm sorry that, <laughs> that you got hurt but but uh very, very cool story. Yeah. The worst uh, part I think was the toboggan ride down. Cause it happened like halfway down, like their longest hill. So I had yeah. felt like I was in that toboggan <laughs> forever going down. With, with being pulled by everyone. Like yeah. seeing the, yeah. oh, look, another one got I hurt. I peeked out at one point. We're going right underneath the chair. I felt like, oh, great. Everybody's staring down at me. I just reached my glove out and I gave the <laughs> thumbs up and start waving. They all start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, I'm still alive. Just hurt my leg. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, that's a funny. <laughs> I, that's a, yeah, that's a, would be a very uh, like that awkward, you know, like yeah. get pulled down the rest of the mountain, like just yeah. on the, <laughs> by the, by the ski patrol. Yeah. Very funny. Um, when, when people hear this and they want to reach out to you, I know, you know, you've got your own, uh, po uh bigger pockets podcast. What, what's the best way for people to, to reach out? Yeah, definitely check out the real estate rookie podcast. And then, um, I'm also on bigger pockets. I have an account on there under Ashley care. Then also you can reach me on Instagram at wealth from rentals. And then we also have a YouTube channel too, for real estate rookie. And we'll put all of it in the show notes. Um, last question for you, Ashley. What what piece of advice would you give to someone? And you're in a unique position in that you have this real estate rookie podcast, so you probably have this, <laughs> do this a lot. But what <laughs> what what advice would you uh, would you give to someone who is, you know, kind of getting started into real estate to help them, you know, succeed? I would say work for somebody. Work for an investor, a property management company. There's so many jobs that you can do part-time or on the side as a side hustle in real estate where you can get paid to learn. So you could work for a wholesaler doing driving for dollars where he pays you if you bring him a lead. You can um, work for a property management company as a leasing agent showing apartments on Sundays or things like that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there and you'll get to, to network with different people, make different connections. Um, 
you work for a property management company, you're going to get to see, you know, with their systems and processes, how things work, uh, what leases look like, what documents they use, um, you know, what attorneys they use for evictions, things like that. So I think there's a huge advantage in getting that side hustle with another um, investor or even getting a full-time job working for an investor. I remember somebody had once um, messaged me and she had actually left her, um, I think she was maybe like an office assistant or something at a, uh, somewhere and she left her job and started working as a maintenance coordinator. I mean, it really didn't take uh, a much different skill set than from what she had as an administrative assistant. She was answering the phone. She was entering the data into the computer as to what the, you know, what the maintenance request was and sending it off to maintenance. But she got to understand how that whole system worked and was beneficial to her. Yeah. The, the sort of, a, I guess, apprenticeship model mm -hmm. is, is maybe not as common anymore, but it's obviously paid huge dividends for you. And, and I think, I, I mean, that, like I, I used to work in construction and, and, for exactly this reason, I basically mm -hmm. just went and started working for people that worked in construction and got, you know, kind of side jobs and things like that. And it's like, and what that has done for me has been invaluable. And this, mm -hmm. like, I've, I've been able to renovate my own houses, renovate other houses. Like, I just, it, the, the skill set that that helps you, and I got paid, right? Like, I yeah, had, a, it was, a, yeah. it was a job. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's a really good, a really good tip that, that mm -hmm. a lot of people don't, don't think about, like, you know, we do, people do, paid mentorships and stuff like that, but it's, that, that's not really a substitute, I think, for actually getting in the business in some way, like you'll, right. you'll learn yeah. some aspect of it very, very well. So, and you're going to be held more accountable because it's your job. So yeah. where if you're just like me being mentored by an investor and he's like, Hey, can you come this day to come? You know, I want to show you this. Well, you know what? I actually have a party to go to or something like that, but right. this is your job. You're going to show up. You're going to take advantage of everything. And also I feel like, like, I would at least feel this way. And I know there's a couple other investors that feel this way is when somebody does offer their help for free, you almost feel like guilty. Like, yeah, definitely come hang all this drywall for me and do this work for me. Yeah. I'd love it. You for, do it for free. And so I think that, um, sometimes like offering services for free, isn't really that great of an advantage to someone because they might feel guilty taking those services from you for free or not, um, I guess, like give you the accountability that you would need if, um, if it was a paid position or learn as much. Yeah. 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 I think the accountability piece is huge because if you, yeah, if you're like, come, you're, Oh, I'll come work for you for free, but you, you probably don't feel as like committed and obligated to you know, like, Oh, well, if I'm hanging drywall for someone for free, I don't have to, you know, that like, right. and they're not if, giving like, me they do it wrong, If they do it wrong or it doesn't turn out good or something. Right. Yeah. I mean, even if they were just scanning documents for me and they scanned them into the wrong file folder, I would feel so bad saying like, you know, I actually right. like <laughs> did the work wrong. I know you did it for right. free. I didn't pay you anything. I appreciate it, but it was all done wrong where yeah. you're being paid. You could say, you know, it's a lot easier to tell somebody they yeah. did it wrong, show them how to correct it and things like that. So. Yeah. Makes, makes total sense. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. I, it's been great. Uh, I think your, your story is a, a really good one for people to and it, obviously check out the, the rookie podcast, but I, I think uh, it's been really valuable to hear kind of what you're doing. And I, I, you have sort of an outside, outside the box thinking process, I think, in terms of what you're investing in and everything, which just, it just speaks to the fact that you can kind of do anything in real estate and still be successful and and, yeah. and build that life of spontaneity that you spoke of. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's fantastic. And I think for anyone listening that the reason I've gotten to that is because I stuck with small buy and hold multifamily for years. Like I, I could go and buy a property in my market, a, a duplex, and I could renovate it and rent it out like in my sleep. And I got that model down. So, and I'm still doing that. So that's like, I have that foundation. I have that steady rock. So I can go off and like dabble in these, yeah. these yeah. other things and see like, okay, if this is what I want to do and not have a ton of risk. Cause I still have that strong foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. Okay. Well, we'll say goodbye. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. If you like this episode, please, uh, subscribe, comment, uh, 
give us give us a shout out. So uh, thank you very much again for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.